Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. My name is John Braden. We are an on-air progressive dialogue on culture, politics, and the critical issues of our time. And tonight we begin our show on the Hoboken waterfront. Uh, this is Sunday, November 4th, and about six days ago a hurricane came through here, Hurricane Sandy, and uh, paved the path of destruction uh, throughout the New York City metropolitan area, the Jersey Shore, New York City, Hoboken got hit especially hard. Um, and we're just looking around here, we could see some of the evidence of that destruction. Some trees were uprooted here. Uh, these beautiful trees are now all destroyed. And um, unfortunately, several people have lost their lives. Uh, I think it's up to 100 now nationwide. Um, several others, you know, still without power. We're very lucky to have gotten our power back today. We survived this terrific storm. Um, and I think in moments like this, we realize also how important it is to be in a community, uh, to care about our neighbors, um, to be in dialogue with each other through these uh, very difficult times, you know, when you would see somebody on the street that you know, and you get into a conversation, how are you, how's everything going, you okay, are you safe, how's your family, uh, also meeting strangers, and a uh, wonderful thing on Hudson Street in Hoboken where people were putting out uh, electric strips that you could char charge our uh, cell phones there and also, you know, engage in some conversation with each other and be, be in connection, be in community, I think that's very important in a crisis like this, but I think it should be important all the time as well. I think uh, as a society we've gotten too atomized, too fragmented, too disconnected from each other. And as a result of that, I think uh, that's one reason our politics has gone down and, and the will of the people is being ignored and our democracy is becoming weaker. Uh, we actually filmed a show here not too long ago. It was actually in August on the anniversary of uh, the Hiroshima bombing, uh, August 6th. And we, we filmed the show here on the waterfront where I discussed the global warming and uh, what's been happening there in terms of uh, the climate crisis. You know, we had a chunk of ice the size of Manhattan that broke off of Greenland earlier this year. Um, and uh, according to scientists, the storms like we just experienced with Sandy and uh, Irene last year are only going to get worse because of the climate change because the oceans are getting warmer. Um, there's an organization uh, called 350.org started by a guy named Bill McKibben which is a very important group uh, that uh, has identified a very key number which is 350, 350 parts per million. That's how much carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere is sustainable that anything beyond that point we're, we're facing a very grave crisis and we could uh, basically see uh, worse ecological destruction down the line 350 parts per million that's the cutoff we are now at 392 parts per million so we're above the cutoff point okay uh, throughout our history like from going back millions of years the beginning of recorded history until only 200 years ago, uh, the amount of carbon has never exceeded 272 parts per million. That's another number you should know. 272 parts per million. That is the highest it's ever gotten up until about 200 years ago when the Industrial Revolution began and we started using coal and oil and uh, gasoline and gasoline cars now in the 20th century we started you know the American automobile uh, became ubiquitous and became marketed mass marketed throughout the population um, even um, I, you know, one, one of the good things about this uh, blackout uh, with not having television was I got to listen to radio more and I got to rediscover the joys of radio and in particular WBAI and the other night I was listening to BAI and they were, had uh, speeches by Noam Chomsky uh, speeches from 1969 uh, 1981 and 1992 the great public intellectual Noam Chomsky who you rarely see on mainstream media uh, and in one of his speeches he was talking about how uh, the suburbanization of our society was really engineered beginning in the 1950s uh, to facilitate the growth of the auto industry, okay? The idea that people would live uh, far away from cities in suburban villages, starting with Levittown, Long Island, and then extending into New Jersey, places like Paramus, New Jersey, the shopping mall culture where you have to get into your car and drive everywhere, you know, and, and all of that is uh, creating a tremendous 
tremendous amount of air pollution, uh, CO2 emissions, okay, you got people driving around with SUVs. Uh, as you recall, when Jimmy Carter was president in 1979, there was an oil uh, embargo, and one of the uh, reactions to the Carter administration was to push for Americans to become um, independent of foreign oil, and one of the things he did, Jimmy Carter, was to put a, uh, a solar panel on the roof of the White House. Well, as soon as Ronald Reagan came to power, he took that solar panel out, you know. Uh, and also, Carter was pushing for a speed limit for people to drive under 55 miles an hour and to use smaller cars. Uh, since 1981, we've seen the rise of the SUV and people just not caring, a selfishness about polluting, okay. Uh, we have an ecological crisis going on in our society right now, and neither major party, the Democrats or Republicans, are addressing it, as far as I can see, you know. Uh, I'm hoping the Democrats will find their soul and get back in, in a progressive direction. Certainly they are much more green uh, than the Republicans, but not green enough, okay? And the most green party we have is actually called the Green Party. And uh, by the time you'll be watching this, uh, it'll be after the election, so there's no way I'm going to influence the election with this broadcast. But I will certainly cast my vote for Jill Stein, uh, who is the Green Party candidate for uh, president, um, and continue to talk about the Green Party and I urge you to talk to each other, to talk to your neighbors, to talk to strangers, to get as much information as you can about this climate crisis, get the facts, find out what's going on, do what needs to be done as far as creating a society in which we're using solar power and wind power and water power and getting off the carbon emissions, getting off oil, getting off gas, stop the hydrofracking, which both the Democrats and Republicans are promoting and move into a green economy. There are, there are uh, some scientists who actually believe that uh you know, we could we could just put solar panels on in, in the Sahara Desert, okay, in the deserts of Arizona and New Mexico, and this would basically we would all be completely energy self-sufficient, okay, natural energy from from the sun, okay, um, and also we could go back to uh, putting water wheels on in streams, you know, damming rivers and, and using that, you know, power, wind power, windmills, we could put wind windmill farms, you know, throughout the United States, because if we don't do that, folks, here's the thing, what you saw with Hurricane uh, Sandy is only uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg. These storms are going to get worse and worse. Uh, you know, the temperature of our oceans has risen only one degree in the past 50 years, one degree, but that's a lot. And, and scientists predict that it's going to go up another six degrees by the end of the century. So did you have a good time with this Hurricane Sandra, Sandy? I don't think so, you know, but we want to make sure that uh, these things uh, don't get any worse and we should not be apathetic. I'm hoping that this storm wakes people up. This is my hope. The silver lining that comes out of this is that people really will become inspired to take action, to take political action to, uh, to, to bring back a democracy in America. Thank you. So we're continuing our, our post-hurricane show here, six days after Hurricane Sand Sandy. I was going to say Sandra, but Sandy. Um, we're at the Symposia Bookstore, which is a nonprofit bookstore in Hoboken. It's also a community treasure. It's also a place where we began our television show for one year. We broadcast in roundtables here, uh, citizen dialogues, and, and, and uh, so it's always good to come back and reconnect with Symposia. It's a wonderful uh, space, for democratic space, intellectual space, uh, place of connection. Uh, and here we have our friend Enrique, who was a guest on our show in practically every, you know, show we had for the first year of our program and has always some insightful things to say about politics or culture. And Enrique, wh wh what's your um, reaction to the hurricane? Uh, the hurricane, well, they did warn us about coming uh, hurricane, a powerful one, even more powerful than Irene, and uh, people somehow they thought that it might just make another turn and not be as bad as it was, but it turned out to be as bad as they said it was going to be. Mm -hmm. But um, um, 
Surprisingly, I think uh, the power's back. I think it came back sooner than a lot of people expected because many so-called uh, um, people that know about power and electricity, all that stuff, PSEG, PSENG, <coughs> said that it would, uh, even as um, uh, as yesterday, they said it could be another week, but apparently power is just about in the, uh, 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 at the entire city. So that's good. Okay, I want to ask you a question about climate change and global warming. A lot of scientists say that because of the uh, nature of, of the uh, climate crisis, that storms like this are going to continue to get worse and worse. Uh, what's your take on that? Do you think that there's a connection between global warming and these kind of storms? That's not your area? What's your thoughts? You know? climate, climate and climate change is not, not, it's not my forte, so I, I can speak on that. So. Um, I can only say that maybe um, I'm sure the city will be working on future storms so that we can get power, uh, especially in Washington being the main street and where uh, the major businesses are in town. Uh, that shouldn't be the last street to get power back. It should be one of the first to get power back. Okay. Uh, of course, I live in Washington, so. <laughs> wow. Uh, Enrique, I want to ask you, what about Symposia Bookstore as a community space during the storm? Have you noticed any evidence of people coming together and this as a place of kind of comfort for people? Or what, what's your take on that? Um, for me, I just, I, I, it was like business as usual. I didn't notice any people coming together, maybe in places like the Elks, you know, where they serve free meals and things like that, people. But uh, in a bookstore, people that just came to buy books, just just uh, as if it was a normal day, nothing special. I, I, I do think that climate change uh, is something we really should be concerned about. And um, I think we need to educate the public about this and thinking about the politics and uh, getting people to really think about these kind of substantial issues, you know. And uh, I, I, I'm concerned as an educator, and I see how the educational crisis is affecting our society, and especially when we have a two-party system that I think is basically an oligarchy um, and a corporate-controlled media, which uh, doesn't really allow too much truth out there. Um, as I was saying earlier, uh, I was listening to a speech by Noam Chomsky on WBAI radio uh, the other night, and he was talking about um, how the growth of our car culture has sort of been engineered by, by obviously by corporations, you know. Uh, he was saying about how back in 1947, there was a consortium of General Motors, Firestone Tire, and I think Goodyear Rubber also which bought up all of the electric trolleys in America, which were functioning very well. And, uh, you know, my grandmother tells me stories about riding the trolley, the electric trolley, when she was a little girl from Fort Lee, New Jersey, to the ferry, which was in Edgewater at the time. Um, and what what this conglomeration did was they bought up all of the, all of the, uh, which were like basically light rail systems that were in place and they got rid of them so they could introduce their cars and buses and it wouldn't be competing with them. Um, they were actually sued and uh, they lost in court and they had to pay a $5,000 slap on the wrist fine in a Chicago court. So it's just one example and I guess, you know, we're talking about climate change and climate crisis and pollution and what could be, and I know Enrique is a very political person, you know, he's someone who always has something very sharp and incisive to say and, and we are now finding ourselves just a few days before, literally two days before a general election, an election in which uh, we have to be very careful that the Republicans don't steal this one because they have all kinds of uh, crazy measures in place now that uh, you have to check your ID and all you know things that were not in place before. And in fact, if you look at the debates that we just had, we had a debate in which the Green Party was actually left out. So you just had Democrats and Republicans. So Enrique, what is your take on the impending election and what are, what are your thoughts on what's going to happen on Tuesday? Oh, also the Green Party candidate, Jill Stein, is she, is she a Green Party candidate? She's, she's a presidential nominee. Well, she was together with another fellow, I can't remember because I just read the article, they were handcuffed at, and, and held for a couple hours at a, at a warehouse. Yeah, they were handcuffed and, 
Well, t to me, the elections are a sham because uh, the ones who really decide the elections is the electoral colleges. And uh, I was reading an article on commondreams.org by, can't remember the name right now, but it says that since 1824, 16 times in which the uh, candidate had the most votes didn't win the election because the electoral colleges are the ones that really have the final say. So, you know, people say that, oh, you got to vote, or if you don't vote, then, you know, then uh, don't complain. Well, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you complain or not. It's already the fix. The fix is already in. Okay. <laughs> and it, it, the, the machines already are determined who's going to be the winner. So, yeah. um, um, you know, those that want to vote independent, you know, that's that's great, but th the winner's always going to be one of the two candidates from the two major parties. Well, and, and one of the things Enrique is doing very well is articulating the problem, which we really need to do. That's the first step is to name the problem, and, and one way you do that is in dialogue with community and citizens getting together and having these kind of discussions, and we need to have more of them in bookstores and in and, and community centers and in people's homes. And But I think the next step forward is to actually solve the problem and figure out how we can fix this and, and not be cynical and be hopeful and figure out how do we create a formative politics, how do we create uh, can the Democrats be pushed in a more progressive direction? I like to think that hopefully that's possible. I also belong to a Democratic club, the Village Independent Democrats. But at the same time, I'm also involved with Green Party politics, and I don't think it's a contradiction. I think, I think, I think historically in America, when you've had a strong presence, a third party can also pull the Democrats over in a more progressive direction. As an example, Huey Long. Huey Long was a candidate for president in 1936, and he was a very powerful figure. He was a governor of New Orleans. Uh, he believed in redistribution of wealth, so he was coming from a radical left position. And at that time, Roosevelt, FDR, felt threatened by Huey Long, and that's when he signed the Social Security Bill. It was something I just learned, you know. Uh, at the same time, uh, behind a lot of the FDR legislation, the New Deal legislation, you had an impetus at the time from the far left in terms of a very strong radical presence in the streets of communists and socialists who were rallying in mass, you know. And there was a there was a tendency to think that it, the country could go even further left. So Roosevelt sort of, you know, put in place uh, a process in which uh, there'd be some pacification or of the masses in a way you know with a new deal program uh, so I think I think uh, supporting the Democrats a, a possible transformation of the Democratic Party can go hand in hand with building up the greens and and some a third party but at the same time Enrique what we're doing right now I want to just emphasize is we're having a discussion Enrique is a guest on our show we're not like these TV shows like Sean Hannity and O'Reilly where you have the same people come on who are paid hacks, who are policy hacks, you know, come in and basically give out propaganda. We interview citizens. We interview people in the street. We interview folks who really have something to say and who are being shut out of our media. And we're trying to transform the media like that. And we love it when you come on, Enrique. And you really are. And also I like it the fact when you're in front of the bookstore. When I walk by, you're very friendly. We have conversations in the street. And this is kind of an amelioration of the alienation we see in our society. Everybody on their cell phones and iPods, turning away from each other. You are a community presence and a community treasure, Enrique. I want to say that. So, anything else you'd like to say about the aftermath? Oh, and who is this over here? We're going to, Enrique is going to give his final thoughts, and we have another one of our citizen philosophers who wandered in, um, Mr. Richard Margolin. Uh, and final thoughts, Enrique? Okay. Well, I think as far as the elections go, for any party to, whether it's Green Party or whatever party, to really have a legitimate opportunity, first the electoral colleges must go. That's that's the title of an article written by someone I, I just can't remember, but I'll look it up. But the first the first step is to get rid of the electoral colleges. Until then, no no candidate has a really legit a legitimate shot of. Um, you know, uh, the, the uh, no has, uh, has a shot of the women one vote.
Thank you, Enrique. Thank you very much. And uh, we'd like to bring Richard on. Uh, our good friend Richard has been a good friend of the Public Voice Salon since our inception. And uh, in fact, uh, I saw Richard uh, the other day uh, when I was charging up my cell phone on Hudson Street. And we're having a little spontaneous salon there, and you'd have to wander by and join the discussion. Uh, Richard, what are your thoughts on the aftermath of this hurricane? And uh, w I'm glad to see that you're safe. Any, any observations about uh, community or about the political situation as well? Hi, John. It's nice to see you again as well, and your lovely wife behind the camera, low-key, but absolutely essential to this production. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I mean, my, my my original reaction was on on Tuesday night while I'm looking at the rain and the wind from my window. I'm saying, oh, yeah, another um, another exaggeration. Uh, there was barely. It seemed like a, a faint uh, drizzle, mist, and the wind was barely barely even visible. And I thought, oh, you know, a, a lot much to do about nothing. And then the following day. Uh, I was just overwhelmed with the with the, with news of the devastation. I mean, it gra it just gradually started. Uh, news about it just started gradually coming and slowly becoming aware of it. And it it wasn't the rain or the wind that affected Hoboken. It was you know it was the surge of the Hudson that uh, you know went into the uh, the sewers and uh, caused all this havoc, which uh, is mind boggling. I mean, someone showed me. Um, these little minnows swimming around sewers on Ninth and Willow, you know, like a mile from the Hudson. You know, they came up. Uh, yeah, it was extraordinary. But you know, people, you know, people lost the valuables. They lost the entire contents of whatever they were storing in basements, which was, and sometimes it was their cars, you know, in the garage. And uh, a lot of people lost their cars. I hopefully they're insured. Um, and then you hear about, <coughs> you know, what happened. Uh, I, I think we were fairly lucky as far as total damage and, and damage to. Uh, and personal injury, that sort of thing. I mean, y you hear about what happened in um, Far Rockaway with the 80 apartments, you know, blowing up in Staten Island. I just heard about that yesterday. With the, uh, the, the I mean, 40 over 40 people died. Oh my God. <coughs> so, um, and uh, so, no, we're we're fortunate and. Yeah, I mean the sense of community is is uh, made made quite an impression, I think, on on lots of people. Uh, people were just the, the, the spontaneity uh, in helping each other, and uh, you know, seeing these these networks of um, you know s chargers along the st one street in Hoboken that actually had power. Uh, uh, some of the some of them had like twenty or thirty, I think, cell phones attached to the uh, to each charger, and. Um, one this one lady was making pancakes at 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> on uh, 11th and Park for everyone. It kind of kind of blew my mind. And as I was saying, I don't I don't think I've ever eaten this well. You know, when the power was on. I mean, the the, the chef at Maxwell's is providing these uh, these these wonderful meals at the Elks Club. You know, like 12 hours a day. And um, and uh, so it's. Uh, I mean, you have. I, I was getting a little sense of. I mean, I, I'm one of the. Now that I'm getting to be a dinosaur, I, I, you know, I, I remember, you know, being five or six years old growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, before there was, you know, when it was a, when it was unusual to actually have a television. I mean, you know, that was like a real novelty, and, uh, and the sense of community was 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 just palpable. I mean, uh, you can't really describe it to people in, in this generation. I mean. All there really was was community, and it was. I mean, the communities we had then, I think, is quite frankly, I think we're stronger than the nuclear families that, today. Wow. Quite frankly, I mean, it was. It was really. It's. It's hard to describe, and I was. You know, I think I was coming at the tail end of that. It was much stronger, you know, before. I mean, people talk about this crazy nationalism, but you know, in the you know in the early centuries, but a lot of that nationalism was was it was a sense of community that is beyond our imagination, <laughs> you know. Um, not that I'm advocating that, you know, kind of a crazy nationalism now, but, but so, you know, okay. 
Thank, thank you, Richard. So some of the moments that stand out for me uh, were talking to our neighbors right outside our apartment door on either side. There's like three doors, okay? And we had this like group discussion. <laughs> and uh, these are people like I hardly ever talk to. And, you know, how are you doing? How are you getting through the day? Sharing a laugh, you know? Uh, I almost feel a sense of disappointment that the power is back on. <laughs> I, not, not that I'm, I'm so happy and lucky that the, the power and light is back on, but there was a sense like about maybe 15 minutes after the lights came back and I'm on the computer and getting back to normal and then I got on Facebook and I said, wait a minute, is this, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, and what I'm trying to say is that there's something about this experience, okay, for me at least, the sense of meaning that I get out of it is that it's coming out of our apathy and that we shouldn't just go back into that shell. That now that, you know, people are talking to each other again and I think because I think that's what that's what the political crisis is caused by, is, is caused by that alienation. And I think we're going to have worse crises in terms of storms, in terms of all kinds of storms, whether it's natural storms or political storms that are coming at us, unless we start to stay in community and talk to each other and recapture that sense of civility that maybe in part the storm has, uh, you know, has re-evoked in some way. Uh, what do you, th I don't know. Yeah. No, it, 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 I, I really think this is like one of the, the, the central issues of our time. I mean, you know, we, do, ha we get, do get a little taste of it now under, you know, tragic to some extent conditions. And, you know, then we go back to this artificial electronic community, which is, you know, not even a faint echo of what, you know, the experience of being with real people under real circumstances. You know, they had this little hoot nanny at the guitar bar on 11th Avenue at 11 o'clock, 8 o'clock. People were bringing their <laughs> their wine, and the local musicians were getting together. I mean, you know, I, I, this might be going on for another few days or weeks, but I mean, it was like it was gaining momentum, and you were actually we actually had like a real we were having some kind of real civic life here. <laughs> Wow. Uh, a friend of ours, uh, Claudia and I, lives up in Weehawken, and he invited us up to dinner last night, and it was such a great thing just to be, you know, with heat and light, but yet there was a sense of sort of valuing that social life and valuing that connection and that friendship and sharing a bottle of wine and having some good conversation and being, and of course we had to come back to Hoboken where it was dark and it was gloomy and everything, but just <laughs> just getting out a little bit was 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 wonderful. But I think it does make us realize the importance of society, the importance of community, um, and um, I'm just wondering, I mean, the fact is you were sitting here when we walked in, you didn't know you were going to be on our show right now. This is a spontaneous dialogue, folks. There are no... Uh, as much as you think that we spent weeks... We're, we're, we're not, there's no <laughs> cue cards, you know, we don't have cue cards we're reading off of, and, and this, is, this is basically organic conversation. We're shattering the silences in our community. And we're hoping to feature more of this on the air and maybe to inspire others to feel that they can also think out loud and they could speak and they could say their truths. And, um, and so, you know, uh, the empty chairs that are here, you could imagine one day people being there and other people saying, be you. it could be you, it could <laughs> be you. Yes. Don't be apathetic. Get off the couch. <laughs> Come on down and send send me an email. Enrique is here. He's such a sweet guy. He's such a caring person. We have Carmen. We're trying to get Carmen on the show. Carmen's back there, uh, the wonderful owner of this uh, bookstore. Carmen Russo and her husband. They've been so kind to us and allowing us to film here. And uh, hopefully she'll, when when she's ready, she'll come on. We don't want to rush. And. Um, but it's really a bastion to, you know, if, if, if you look at the structure here, you can see the, ta the chairs are in a circle. This is how I teach, by the way. I put my chairs in a circle in my classroom. And for many of my students, it's the first time they've actually taught in, in, been taught in a circle. Because it's the, it's the architecture of democracy, of classroom democracy, you know. And uh, Claudia, my lovely wife, I want to thank my lovely wife, Claudia, without whose help, without whose support. She deserves a big hand. Enrique, clapping over there too, okay. Uh, big, big hand for Claudia, my lovely darling wife, who believes in my craziest dreams. My crazy dream to have a television show. Who would have thought me, I would have a TV show. Claudia believed in my dream, and here we are. And uh, you all can have TV shows too. You all can be on my TV show if you want to, you know. Um, we don't want anybody from the corporatocracy. We want real people here and with things to say. And um, so uh, 
Okay, now we have Carmen Russo. She's going to say a few words. Uh, uh, we'll, would like to say how grateful I am and we are to Carmen for allowing us to film in this bookstore and for also allowing us to have a conversation here starting way back in, uh, in 2002 when we started the original Symposia Salon uh, with Cornell, with your husband Cornell, and we had wonderful dialogues and gave me a lot of hope that uh, of being in community with others and finding my voice in the public space and you've always been uh, there for us, Carmen. So I want to thank you for that, and I want to thank you for also being open during this hurricane mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, aftermath. Uh, one, one of the first things when I was walking down Washington Street, when I realized everything was going to be okay, when I saw the books outside of Symposia, I said, oh, yes, life goes on, life goes on. Uh, Carmen, what are some of your thoughts about the aftermath of Hurricane uh, Sandy and, and the sense of community that you're able to bring here uh, through Symposia? Uh, thank you, John, for yeah. doing that. I yeah. think that you are a main factor in strengthening community here. So thank you for doing that. The first sign of uh, community strength was that I got to know more my uh, neighbors. I had neighbors that I didn't know. So with this op occasion, I got to know them. Um, so another important thing was that I didn't want to stay home. I came here to be with the community and even nice. if we didn't have electricity I opened a store and I knew that people um, don't carry cash or don't have cash maybe nice. during this time so I yes. put a note there hmm. no cash to purchase no worries uh, you can take the book and yes. maybe bring the money later on yes. so it was a lot of goodwill uh, people came and some even gave even more than the book was worth yeah. because they felt so good yes. to be here and not to have to pay for the books. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was a very good experience. Another one was, uh, I, I am a yoga teacher and I uh -huh. like to work out and to teach. Yes. So I said, if I am working out for myself, why wouldn't I open the doors? And uh -huh. if somebody else wants to come and join me, he's welcome. Yes. So I put a note, free yoga uh -huh. at three o'clock. So I offered a few days free yoga here in the bookstore. That's wonderful. And, uh, I had a very good response. That's some new people, some from my regular students came. Wow. And wow. Yeah. I'm so glad. It's always rare to get Carmen to come on the air. She's always so busy. And uh, But uh, one of the things I also want to remind the uh, people watching our show is that when uh, Symposia Bookstore first came to Hoboken, they w it was part of a spiritual project. And the original name for Symposia was Faith Books when it was on Willow Avenue. And it was part of a project to reimagine spiritual life and community. And we are also trying to uh, focus on spiritual issues as well. I belong to a group called the Network of Spiritual Progressives, which is trying to strengthen the, a spiritual left to resist the religious right, you know. And, um, and so, uh, you know, uh, and also uh, uh, Carmen's husband, Cornell, is now studying for a doctorate in community psychology, which is, so, uh, this is a brand new, um, a brand new uh, field of scholarship, which is emerging, you know, and I think uh, with all the alienation we see in our society, when you see people fixated to their iPods and ignoring each other, it's so wonderful to have a place like Symposia where you could come and even just looking at the books outside the, the store, you know, you could actually stop and f while you're looking at a book, you could talk to a neighbor, you can see some... I have many conversations with Enrique, who likes to stand outside, you know, and, and when we see all the baby carriages lined up, we know that you're having puppet shows here. And it's, it, again, you know, these are things, when you walk by all the other stores, you know, most of the other stores are just focused on commerce, strictly commerce. This is not about commerce. You're not about commerce. You're not about... Our mission is... Your mission is community. Um, how is that sense of the spiritual and the community, and is there, would there might be a political aspect to that as well? I think spirituality is immersed in community. Okay. You cannot have one without the other. Okay. So uh, this is what we are trying to create here. People to get closer to each other and mm. closer to their better self, wow. higher self. Well, I, I, the, my, my interpretation of the political meaning is that I believe that these kind of discourses strengthen our democracy.
So you're, you're keeping our democracy strong and healthy here in Hoboken, and, and, and not only that, but cultural life and intellectual life and social life as well. This is the only bookstore in Hudson County. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's important to read books. I'm an English professor. I tell you, you know, it's very important. What, one of the great things during this uh, hurricane was I got to read more. Yeah. <laughs> and at, yeah. at, at times I was even actually reading at night in bed with a flashlight. <laughs> and Claudia said, watch the batteries. We've got to watch the batteries. But I have to read one more page, you know, and and so you did get to catch up on your reading, yeah. Yeah, yeah I've read like. Oh my God! Uh, days, uh, more uh, than uh, the whole year. Any thoughts on what you're reading now? Anything in particular? Uh, I am reading um, uh, "Pigs in Heaven" by Barbara Kiss King Slover, okay. oh, which yes. is She's a great, writer. great wow. book. Yeah. Fabulous. Wow. Well, uh, Carmen, thank you so much for spending time with us today, and keep doing what you're doing. And and uh, you okay, very good. Okay. <laughs>
at that point, you know, I think when a president could really actually represent the people, which I don't think, I don't think that's the case right now. I think the president is uh, beholden to corporate interests, and I think uh, we really do need to get all the money out of politics, you know, and repeal Citizens United and get back to a level playing field where an actual person could uh, engage the political system and, and really feel like they would have uh, be able to accomplish something. Uh, but that's not how it is now, and um, uh, that's why I will continue to broadcast on the show and try to let you know what I think about things and, and, and also try to model, you know, for the citizens a way that they could also, uh, you could also find your public voices on the air. Uh, you could certainly come on my show. We're always looking for guests, you know. And, um, and I think, you know, we really are at a crisis point in our democracy now where, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting tired of watching TV in terms of uh, going back and forth between Fox and, and CNN and, 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 uh, and CNBC because I, I don't think those folks represent me and what I think and, and not even the people at CNBC who you would think, you know, because I'm liberal and I'm progressive that they would have my best interests in mind and I don't think they do. Um, they are kind of very narrowly focused between a center-right Democratic Party and a radical right, far right Republican Party, and they sort of toggle back and forth in between. You know, is it going to be Obama? Is it going to be Romney? Obama, Romney, Obama, Obama. You know, it's it's one and the same. You know, it really is. Certainly, I think Obama's a better choice than Romney, but. Um, but, uh, you know, there are other candidates out there. There is Jill Stein, who has the Green Party nomination this year, and I probably will vote for her. Um, yeah, most definitely I believe I will vote for her uh, because, um, you know, we do need to wake things up. We need to shake things up. We need to um, get our democracy back. Um, and I think that... Um, I think it's possible. I really do. I think I have hope. Um, call me an idealist. Call me, uh, some people might think I'm naive, but I do believe that, uh, you know, our country was founded uh, in a revolution. And I think that um, we need to have another revolution, a peaceful revolution, um, and uh, to reverse uh, this right wing hegemony, which has really taken root over the past 30 years, especially since Ronald Reagan became president. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, began his campaign for president um, in a town called Philadelphia, Mississippi, where he basically made a speech where he talked about states' rights. And when you make a speech about states' rights in a place like Philadelphia, Mississippi, which was famous or infamous for being the place where three civil rights workers were murdered. And um, this happened in 1964. It's a very symbolic place for Reagan to have begun his campaign. And um, it was very obviously he was appealing to Southern racists. And he was saying that, I'm your guy now. And uh, I'm so surprised the press gave him a free pass on that, you know. And every time he said, states' rights, I believe in states' rights, the crowd came to their feet cheering, you know. And states' rights is really like a, uh, a euphemism for uh, don't tell us how to treat our black folk down here, you know. You Yankees go up north and... Uh, because the civil rights workers were coming in from up north, they were being bused, they were bused in, and and they were helping the, uh, you know, the southern uh, uh, cause for emancipation for or for civil rights that were being denied, um, in the the Jim Crow laws that held right through the 1960s until the Voting Ra Rights Act, which was passed in 1965. Before that, the blacks couldn't vote, and and Ronald Reagan was against the Voting Rights Act. You know. So here's the guy who created the modern Republican Party. This is the one who they all bow down to, Mr. Reagan. And um, he began his campaign with a racist appeal, you know. Um, so, you know, we, we still have racism in our society. We have classism. We have sexism. But I think on the left, I think one of the things that has to be done 
And one of the problems with the left is that it fell apart in the 1970s. You had identity politics. And um, we need to pull together progressive people, have to really look overlook the differences that we have and sh see that we have a lot more in common and, and realize who the enemy is, this cabal, this 1% or 1% of the 1% that's controlling the society, that's pulling all the strings. And uh, we need to get back to uh, a situation where we have, uh, the people have a say in, in, what's, in what is done. And, and um, you know, I think uh, the public has to find its voice. That's why we have a television show called The Public Voice Salon. That's the name of our show. And I'd like to model that for you. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, continue this. And um, it's, it's strange to be just sitting here in my apartment uh, talking to a camera in an empty room, you know. Uh, usually my wife uh, Claudia is here and there's one person uh, with me, but uh, this is something that I think needs to be done. My wife is uh, actually working today, you know, we're just getting back to normal after the storm. I had a class at Essex County College that uh, I couldn't get to because, uh, you know, the buses are going a long way and the PATH train is that I normally take the PATH train from Hoboken to uh, Essex County College in Newark where I'm teaching uh, two classes, one in writing and one in uh, Western literary tradition. Um, and uh, so I'm um, basically home today working on my book, my new book I'm writing. Uh, my book that, uh, my last book that I wrote is set to be published in a couple of weeks, and it's called The Ethical Sales Agent. Okay, the, tr it's a, the subtitle is A Transformative Sales Pedagogy to Liberate Corporate Culture and Save America. I do believe that um, uh, we can start to change wherever we are. Uh, since I'm a person who works in the academy as an English professor, I've been fighting for change inside the academy and in my classrooms and uh, opening up spaces of freedom and for my students to find their voices and speak to each other and grow and change. And now uh, that I find myself in corporate America as a real estate agent, since uh, uh, you can't make a living as an adjunct professor in a society that doesn't value teaching, um, I'm finding that uh, the experience of being in corporate corporate America is actually very different than when I was 17 years ago before I went into teaching. Um, I had done a stint in corporate America. I was in, I was in computer sales for a while. I was working also in an automotive warranty company affiliated with AIG. And I was in banking a little bit there. And, uh, but uh, I found that the inhumane elements and the undemocratic uh, nature of the corporate uh, society at that time, it's only gotten worse, you know, and uh, it's become very autocratic and authoritarian. We do not have democracy in the workplace, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Uh, I'm sure that's not news to you if you have a, especially if you have an autocratic boss, you know, especially if you don't belong to a union. Uh, we used to have a strong union movement in this country. We had 35% uh, of the workforce was unionized. Now it's down to 12%. And uh, my dad was also the uh, president of his union, the uh, IATSE union of uh, theatrical workers in uh, northern New Jersey. So I grew up in a union household and I have great respect for unions. Um, and um, I'm actually reading a wonderful book by Stanley Aronowitz, um, and it's about C. Wright Mills, who was a great uh, public intellectual, who um, he wrote a book back in the 1950s. It was, I think it was his first book, which was called The New Men of Power. And it was basically about how the, the labor leaders were being co-opted by the system, by the, uh, by the elites, and uh, they basically began to identify more with the power structure than with the rank and file. So that's how the unions were kind of bought out. And uh, as a result, the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, effectiveness of unions began to decline and to the point where now they're practically non-existent. And uh, you see that the with the outsourcing of jobs overseas to China and to uh, the third world so that you could basically circumvent the union movement in the United States and employ uh, workers who were uh, being paid like a slave wage over in countries that don't 
really care about human rights, and American workers really can't compete with that. So now we basically have um, the people that are running our societies. It's like uh, the, it's it's the World Bank, it's the World Trade Organization, it's a it's a cabal of transnational capitalism, and they make the decisions. You know, um, there was a TV. Uh, I'm sorry, not a TV, a radio show on the other night uh, during the blackout. I was listening to a show about uh, the uh, battle in Seattle back in 1999 when you had the World Trade organization had a meeting in Seattle and people were gathered in the streets thousands of people were rebelling against that and it made a lot of noise and it really did uh, uh, I think show you that even before Occupy Wall Street there was a lot of resistance here in, the, in America to this uh, international autocracy which has beginning to really even replace uh, independent countries, that the countries don't matter so much. It's this uh, wealthy elite that's, uh, you know, controlling politics all, all over the world. And so uh, what do we do? We have to fight back. We have to get our country back. We have to get our world back. We're just going to keep getting worse storms like this, like we had with Hurricane Sandy. And if we don't uh, do something in a hurry to, uh, to restore our democracy, and um, what you can do about it is to start to read books, start to learn what's going on, start to listen to public radio like WBAI, uh, start to watch our show, start come on my show if you want to, and, or start your own show, and begin to speak the truth. And that's all, basically, I have to say. I don't know how much time is left, because usually my wife Claudia is here, and she tells me how much time is left. So I'm going to have to uh, check and see how much time is left here. Let's see. Uh, uh, where does it say? Usually it's, uh, oh, I'm going to have to get up. One second, excuse me. Um, uh, 52, okay, so uh, five, I think it's five, yeah. Yes, about five minutes left. We have five minutes left. And um, so anyway, this is about as rough and raw as it gets. You know, we can't, there's nothing uh, planned about this. It's just me talking. And uh, if, if you were here, we would be talking together. We'd be having a conversation. If there were other people here, we'd be sitting in a circle and we'd be having a dialogue. Um, I'm actually reading a book now. I'm actually rereading a book called The Tao of Dialogue uh, by a guy named Doug Ross, and it's all about the dialogic process. And I was actually going to teach this uh, uh, yesterday when, uh, when I couldn't get to uh, Essex County College because of the aftermath of the storm. And this was the lesson that I had planned was to, to teach my students about about dialogue and and um, because many of them don't know they haven't been taught about this and it's something that I found in the past is very helpful when my students can learn uh, certain uh, concepts and categories of you know the importance of listening the importance of uh, of uh, being able to change your mind and not sort of be so rigid. I think our politics in our country now has gotten so knee-jerk, you know? It's like you say something that triggers something else in somebody, and it's almost like pre-scripted. It's almost like these, you know, these Fox News versus, you know, CNBC. It's like this, it's become so polarized that the ability to even have an intelligent conversation, I think, has been compromised. And uh, people start yelling and get angry, and this is the last thing I want to do is to get angry about about this stuff. You know, I mean, we have to live our lives, and I think, you know, we we, we do have a right to be angry, and, and and but I think it's how we take out the anger, and it's how we have you know how we have constructive conversations can we get back to these constructive conversations um there's an article in the times uh today there's actually an op-ed piece by a princeton um historian i forget his name but he says uh he says well if you think that our politics is bad today you just remember you know go back to you know the 18 early 1800s and there was a duel fought by Aaron Burr and, and and Alexander Hamilton right up right up in Weehawken I'm just about a couple miles away from that site and Al Aaron Burr was a sitting vice president when he shot uh, you know uh, Alexander Hamilton so I guess it's a history that we go back but 
how do we fight for a peaceful world or you know how do we struggle for a, a world in which it's more loving and kind and caring um, that I think is really the the struggle that we have to really focus on and how do we raise consciousness um, I just was uh, now that the TV is back on I was uh, looking at the shows earlier and I saw Pat Robertson is uh, you know still has a show on the air uh, uh, 700 Club uh, I belong to a group called the Network of Spiritual Progressives, started by Michael Lerner and Cornell West, and we are fighting for a world that's more loving, kind, and caring, um, and more generous, and we have actual legislation that we'd like to be passed, and uh, just like the religious right, they have their agenda, we have our agenda, we're trying to build a, a spiritual left to be as strong as the religious right, you know, at least as vocal, and, and so people know that the, you know, to be religious and to be spiritual doesn't mean you have to be on the right, that, you know, there are also other uh, voices out there, spiritual voices, um, who speak for compassion and who care about the poor and and who really want to create a world uh, you know a world that works for all and um a world based on peace so anyway um i think it feels like it's just about time so uh thank you for watching and please um uh you know stay in touch send me an email uh let me know what topics you'd like to cover if you'd like to come on the show and uh keep hope alive Keep reading, um, you know, and, and continue to grow intellectually, creatively, and socially, and also spiritually. So uh, with that being said, uh, we thank uh, God for helping us get through the storm, and we hope that everything turns out good on Election Day, And but uh, we do want to struggle in, for a politics that's more more democratic and, and more spiritual, I think, in the sense of what real spirituality is about, which is not helping a selfish oligarchy, but is really designed uh, for helping all of the people on the planet. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.